term would be that uh, one is you one is you quantifying things in terms of the elastic forward scattering amplitude of a QQ bar dipole to interact with the proton or nucleus. You can integrate this dipole over the impact parameter to get, get a cross section, or you can Fourier transform the impact parameter dependence, and then you get access to the momentum transfer given to the, uh, given to the target. Now, the good thing about this dipole picture is that as long as we stay at small x, it has a lot of predictive power. It has a predictive power because the same fundamental object, the same amplitude, uh, appears in different DIS processes. You can use the optical theorem to express the total cross section, so F2, FL, as, as something that is linear in this amplitude. <clears throat> you can uh, use it to calculate inclusive diffractions or diffractive structure functions by, by Fourier transforming and, and then squaring. And if you complement this with some uh, with some description, some weight wave function for describing a hadronization into a vector meson, you can calculate exclusive vector meson production. And this is not everything. Of course, when you go to proton, 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 nucleus, and nucleus, nucleus collisions, the same object, the same degrees of freedom appear in cross sections. They appear in initial conditions for the, for the color fields that give, uh, create a quark gluon plasma. And all of these are expressed in terms of the same, <coughs> the same amplitude. So this is why. Uh, this is somehow it has a large degree of universality in that and, and it's very, it's a very useful concept so if one wants to have a slightly more microscopic understanding of what this dipole amplitude is uh, one it is useful to think in terms of this cgc color glass condensate picture of a high energy nucleus or proton <clears throat> and in the cgc picture the scattering of a dilute probe on a high energy nucleus or, or nucleon Describe, is described in the iconal approximation. It is described by an iconal scattering amplitude and the, and the color degrees, the color field degrees of freedom that, that dominate the small x somehow wave function, the small x degrees of freedom in the nucleus are represented as a classical strong, non-perturbatively strong color field. <clears throat> so what the, so the basic degree of freedom is this Wilson line, which is a path ordered exponential you know, path ordered exponential in the color field of of the target and it's an and this path ordered exponential is a, is an iconal scattering amplitude for a dilute probe that goes through this target <clears throat> so now if you have a dipole a dipole is a, is a color neutral quark anti quark state the scattering amplitude for such a dipole is a two point function of a wilson line times its emission conjugate so this is a color singlet well-defined gauge invariant color, color, color singlet operator. And you can take expectation values of this color singlet operator in, in the wave function of the target that you then describe in, in some way. In the CGC picture, the sources of this color field are the large X degrees of freedom, the large X partons that, that radiate gluons and the small X gluons. <clears throat> uh, but the only thing that one really needs to know about this large X partons is the color charge. Everything else is integrated out in this, in this effective theory approach. The other nice thing about this formulation is that gluon saturation is not something that is kind of extraneous. Gluon saturation is really built in into this formulation from the beginning because the gluon, satur gluon saturation really follows as just a unitarity requirement. These Wilson lines are SU3 unitary matrices and, and corresponding to this the Wilson line, uh, the dipole operator, the dipole amplitude, satisfies a unitarity constraint. It, sa it uh, uh, saturates at the blast, saturates the black disk limit. It cannot grow larger than that. So somehow unitarity, and as a consequence of that, uh, gluon saturation is built into the formalism. It is not. It's kind of automatic. Just follows from from the SU three nature of these of these objects. So this is why this is a good picture to study physics in the gluon saturation regime. So what has been happening recently in the recent years is that there's been a lot of expansion in, in taking this picture to NLO accuracy. So what does it mean to do next to leading order accuracy in the dipole picture? You take this quark anti quark dipole and you let it emit a gluon, of course. And this is one just one representative diagram. Of course, there are many many contributions that you have to do. 
<coughs> that you have to take into account, but you start emitting gluons. So if the leading order is just a uh, you, just a di three level dipole picture, if you emit a gluon that is soft, you pick up a contribution which is a leading logarithm, a log of x. This leading log has to be resummed by evolution equations, BK or Jimwalk evolution, or BFK in the dilute limit. Uh, then you can have contributions that have a log but do not have a, which is not soft. So exact kinematics. These give you next to leading or a correction to the cross sections. Then you can also go to contributions where you have two gluons and one of the two is soft. And this gives a next to leading log contribution, which you resum by including next to leading order contributions to the evolution equation. So this is next to leading order BK or Jimwalk evolution. And all of these, these kind of contributions have been started, have been somehow are starting to become calculated. BK, the BK and Jimwalk evolution equation was derived more than 10 years ago at next to leading order. And more recently, there have been some additional collinear resummations that are really required to stabilize the perturbation theory and really make this into a usable, quanti quantitatively usable equation. <clears throat> when I calculated the total DIS cross section with uh, massless quarks, and, and uh, what is reported in this conference is the first fit to, to of HERA data with this next to leading order impact factor, uh, one can calculate diffractive digits. There are calculations of exclusive light vector meson production using parton distribution amplitudes to describe the uh, describe the vector meson uh, describe the light vector meson, and things that are kind of still developing and partially partially reported, in, uh, including at this conference and partially still under the way, are things like exclusive quarkonium production, so exclusive vector mesons for with heavy quarks. Uh, using an NRQCD approach for the for the vector meson wave function, uh, diffractive structure functions, and total DIS cross sections with massive quarks. And of course, together with this kind of development, there's been a lot of discussion and, and our rele related similar calculation, the similar framework in the case of hadron-hadron, especially particle production in forward proton nucleus collisions, uh, digets. Uh, digest and, and single inclusive particle production, which somehow from a theorist's point of view is, is very much a piece of the same same development in going to next to leading order accuracy in this in this picture, but I will not talk about these calculations that much that much here. Ah, sorry. No, that was too a little bit too fast. <clears throat> okay. So before, before I go on, I want to focus on on somehow a part which is somehow the most fundamental part of these calculations, which is the light cone wave function, virtual photon light cone wave function at next to leading order in perturbation, QCD perturbation theory. So <clears throat> usually when you think of the parton model and you do scattering in the infinite momentum frame, you are really quantizing the partonic constituents of the proton of the target. Here in the dipole picture, it's the opposite. You are quantizing the virtual photon. So what you want to, and, and the virtual photon is a perturbatively understandable calculable object. So what we're doing is we're developing a perturbation theory for the Fox state components of this virtual photon. And the, and the, somehow the formal, the quantity that somehow encodes this is known as the light cone wave function. The light cone wave function is the coefficient in the Fox state expansion of a dressed photon state in terms of bare bare partonic states. <clears throat> and in some sense, this is kind of the last frontier of perturbation theory at one loop. Basically, everything that you can calculate at one loop has been calculated, almost. And, and this, this is the one somehow complicated corner, uh, maybe from, a, from the point of view of doing high order perturbation theory calculations, it's a complicated formulation. We're doing Hamiltonian perturbation theory, so not, not covariant perturbation theory, in light cone gauge and, and in a coordinate system which really doesn't manifestly con uh, conserve rotational invariance. So this makes the calculations more, more complicated, but it's still a, a fundamental one loop calculation in QCD. And, and what has made this kind of advances possible as are, are that now we have gradually learned how to do these calculations. And this wave function is known for massless quarks. It's known for massive quarks for longitudinal polarization. 
and there are very similar developments in the in the quark to quark gluon, which is more more relevant for proton nucleus uh, uh, physics. And I wanted to point out that the fact that at, at this point there's no CGC here. This is just a fundamental one loop perturbative cross section perturbative calculation in QCD perturbative QCD. But it's perturbative QCD in a very specific formulation, Hamiltonian and light front and light cone gauge. That's the convenient formulation for to be applied in the CGC. So what what comes in this comes next in the C, is the CGC picture, which is when you have this quark anti quark state interact with the target, and this is where the CGC the color field part uh, uh, comes in. <clears throat> uh, so this light cone wave function in itself is not observable it's a, but it's a crucial ingredient in many different calculations in basically every every next to leading order calculation of, of dis in this picture that you want to make relies on this light cone wave functions <clears throat> so now we have these light cone wave functions for massive quarks only 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 partially and then we can use use them to get uh, total cross sections f2 fl we can use them to get uh, exclusive cross sections uh, we can uh, uh, one can and will use them to also get diffractive structure functions and, and heavy core cross sections in the near future. <clears throat> in order to do exclusive uh, exclusive measurements, the other ingredient that one needs is kind of on the other side of the diagram. You need to know what is the transition between the quark anti quark state and a vector meson. So here there are of course several different approaches. There are several phenomenological parameterizations that have been very very successful you take a simple well motivated form you fit it to some experimental effect, uh, decay with data and it gives you a pretty robust already a pretty robust understanding of the of the physics uh, there are, you can solve the non-relativistic bound state equation and then do a coordinate transformation to to light cone this gives you also access to come out excited states in a, in a very natural way or you can actually solve the bound state problem in the on the light front, uh, directly solve the bound state problem in the light front perturbation theory. But of course, here you also need a phenomenological confining potential. After all, bound state physics is confining physics. So there's you cannot do this completely from first principles. There needs to be a confining potential. And this program has also been somehow pushed quite uh, quite far, and one is really developing a systematic understanding of this heavy quark state uh, spectra. And then uh, the approach, one approach that gives you a, the way, a way to do a systematical expansion in the QCD coupling is the approach of non-relativistic QCD, where you start around infinite quark mass, and then you develop the theory in terms of perturbative co uh, corrections, and then corrections in the quark velocity. <clears throat> and when you go high to higher orders in this, ex this expansion, you need some additional but universal coefficients that, that you have to take from some data, these long distance matrix elements. But after you have these coefficients, you really have a controlled perturbative expansion. And, and quite recently, this, uh, this approach has also been somehow brought into, into, context, uh, into the context of exclusive vector meson production and light cone wave functions. And, and and this is, has been combined or is being combined to really give a, a perturbative, uh, well-defined perturbative series uh, for these exclusive cross sections in the dipole picture. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> then of course that was small x. Now let's go to a hard uh, collinear uh, picture. Um, and of course. As I said, the collinear factorization, it is not a different, somehow completely different thing. There's a common limit, kind of a double logarithmic common limit, where the dipole picture and collinear factorization agree. So let me, let me now pass through that common limit and go to this dilute limit passing through uh, from, from the dipole picture. And the way I, I would describe this in the dipole picture is that and the dipole cross section is an elastic scattering amplitude. So it means that the final state has to be color neutral. So you have to exchange a color neutral vacuum quantum numbers with the target. The simplest way to do that in perturbative QCD is to exchange two, two gluons. Now two gluon exchange in the amplitude is like one gluon in the cross section. So basically this tells us that the dipole amplitude should be proportional to the gluon distribution. So there's a, there's a 
there's a rough estimate that is actually very successful uh, successful estimate for this dipole amplitude. Of course, if you want to go to next to leading order, such a rough, rough estimate is not enough, and you have to have to define things a little bit more properly. And if you do so, what you end up with is this GPD, the concept of generalized parton distribution, where you write the amplitude as a convolution of <coughs> perturbative coefficient functions and generalized parton distributions. <coughs> So a couple of things to point out in this formulation. These are collinear distributions. So one assumes that transverse momenta are strongly ordered. And this leads to expressions where you only have longitudinal momentum fractions. Uh, there's a, it's a two gluon or next to leading or a two quark also, but it's a two particle operator. And this, the fact that you, uh, this fact allows you to really keep track of the longitudinal momenta of the two gluon separately, which is something you don't really do in the dipole picture. Because the dipole picture, it doesn't, you don't specify whether it's two or five, 56 gluon exchange. The GPD is in a priori an independent object, which is related to the PDF. Uh, so, but uh, one can add small x and with some additional assumptions about unitary, uh, the analytical structure, relate the GPD to the PDF. This is known as the, the Shuvayev transform. And then, of course, one also needs a wave function for the vector meson, which is in most calculations so far in, that are used, uh, one uses a non relativistic approach, but there's no reason why that couldn't be generalized uh, eventually. Well, let's see, 20 minutes into your talk. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so uh, when you put this into, into effect, what you see is that, uh, uh, first of all, uh, NLO corrections in this formulation are very large. They can even change the sign of the amplitude, so they can be more than 100%. Uh, there has been a large scale dependence. So these issues have, have, have required a lot of, a lot of work from uh, especially the, the Liverpool group, uh, who have somehow uh, reorganized the calculation in such a way that one can, one can, one can stabilize the perturbation expansion uh, a little bit more. And, and after a lot of work, I think this has been now start uh, approach the level where one can really make first comparisons with the existing PDFs and one can talk about and think about uh, using this kind of exclusive data in, in fitting uh, parton distribution functions. And, and if one if the, somehow the theory is under control, this is going to be a very powerful, powerful constraint. Now let me uh, move more to uh, kind of uh, experimental uh, measurements. First, of course, the first thing is, is coherent vector meson production in gamma nucleus collision. This has, it's a clear, some of the experimental signal is quite clear. This, uh, this is kind of the mainstay of the ultra peripheral program uh, experimentally. Initially, NLHE run one, these measurements were kind of often statistics limited. But the measurements are getting more detailed and more better all the time. And there are several talks also in this uh, conference presenting new results. Here's, for example, Ali's data on uh, J psi and psi prime production coherent. He has an LHCB extraction of the energy dependence of the gamma P to J psi P exclusive cross section. And, and there's, there's a gradually increasing number of, uh, of data. Let me point to uh, a couple of recent, uh, recent things. One is this quite recent uh, <clears throat> measurement of the T distribution in coherent gamma nucleus uh, events. So first I want to point your attention to the, to the scale on the horizontal axis. So these are very small numbers. These are very small momenta and somehow very accurate uh, measurements. <clears throat> and you have to know that these numbers are extracted from the J psi, it's from the PTs of the J psi decay leptons. You cannot measure the scattered nucleus for, for a heavy nucleus. So, so somehow impressive data. Uh, I, I'm, I somehow have full, still have to fully digest this uh, uh, this thing. Uh, comparing to the EIC, the EIC will is aiming and will do this measurement at up to larger T, where you see more structure. What I don't immediately know is is how well is the EIC precision going to be compared at this small T num values. How well is the EIC precision be? Uh, be comparable to this, uh, this Alice measurement. <clears throat> Generally, the, the result, the, the, what is interesting in this T distribution is that it's very steep. It's steeper than the experimental predictions. Now, qualitatively, you would expect the sa saturation to turn this distribution into a steeper one, uh, but probably not by this much. I know that this BBK already has saturation built in, and it's not as steep as the experimental data. 
So that was coherent. Uh, and uh, uh, one can also measure processes. One can also have processes where the target breaks up into color, into color nuclear constituents so that you leave a rapidity gap. And I, I find it very useful to use this good worker picture of uh, to understand what the coherent and the incoherent cross sections mean. So the, in the good worker picture, the coherent cross section is related to the average gluon density or average amplitude in the target. Whereas the incoherent, which is target breaking up into nucleons or nuclei, nucleons breaking up, it's related to fluctuations in the color gluon density. And if, if you really want to do transverse imaging of nucleus, nuclei and nucleons, we really need to think about measuring both, right? For Alice in this UPC data, <clears throat> as I said, Alice doesn't measure the recoil nucleus, you just measure the PT of the decay, uh, leptons of the J psi. They separate these different components by doing kind of a template fitting of different D distributions into the data. One thing that would be nice is to see more of these turned into numbers for the incoherent cross sections, which I, I presume Alice uh, is, uh, it will do at some point. Uh, for protons, you can measure at the EIC, you will be able to measure these recoil protons and do this bro proton break of physics uh, by separating really the uh, coherent and incoherent. For nuclei at EIC, this is a big challenge. Can we understand the nuclear breakup well enough? Can we measure the nuclear breakup events well enough to really be able to do this? Uh, do this physics by actually measuring and not just template fitting uh, to the data. So this is a big topic in, in the plans for EIC. Almost 25 minutes. Yeah. Okay. So uh, <clears throat> toward, towards the end, then there, of course, this was a, a vector meson, exclusive vector mesons. There are other UPC measurements. There's lots of other interesting physics that is gradually as this program is, is gaining steam, one is, uh, uh, one is it's expanding into new directions. One is exclusive digits. So there's a CMS measurement of exclusive digits, where what you do is that you measure things, you're, you're interested in the angular distribution in the angle of the total angle of the digit versus the relative angle of the two jets. And this gives you access to transverse momentum distribution of gluons, gluon polarization, the Wigner function. The advantage of the LHC, of course, here is that you can go to very large PT where you actually really have the clear jet direction, much less, uh, much less, un, uh, much uh, without that much uh, ambiguities. In the EIC, the kinematics is going to be more limited, but of course, this is an ex important part of the EIC experimental program. You can look at non-QCD final state, gamma, gamma to gamma, gamma, light by light scattering, lepton, uh, anti-lepton both for new physics searches, and then you can use these to understand the photon flux, the photon polarization, the transverse momentum dependence, the proton, photons really have a very, very small transverse momentum, but it's still something you can, you can measure if you're accurate enough. For example, in the star data, there's a cosine four phi asymmetry, which is related just to the linear polarization of these photon vector, uh, photon uh, to incoming photons, and that is kind of a QED calculation that can be that can be done. There's an atlas measurement of inclusive digit production in gamma A. And here there's also already a theory comparison. Uh, unfortunately, this data is still uh, preliminary because it kind of hasn't been unfolded. And from a theorist point of view, it would be really very nice to see this, this data, data finalized. Uh, I hope it will be done someday. And then as a, as a last topic, uh, azimuth and anisotropy. So a, a real photon, of course, has a resolved component. So it can, in some collisions, it really behaves as a hadron. So basically, to some approximation, you can even think of some of these events where you don't have a hard scale. as kind of a rho meson nucleus collision. And if you have a rho meson nucleus collision, you can kind of view the same heavy ion analysis as you do in a proton nucleus collision or nucleus nucleus collision and look for collective phenomena. So what, what do I mean by heavy ion type analysis here? You separate these events into uh, centrality, centrality classes or multiplicity classes with high multiplicity and low multiplicity events. You use the low multiplicity as kind of a, a background or somehow baseline. And then you can look for azimuthal correlations that look like are, that are taken as indications of some kind of collective effects. And here in the upper plot, of course, you don't really see them by eye, but if you actually look at the, do the numbers carefully, 
here's an atlas measurement that actually sees a v2 this kind of a flow component in these high multiplicity photon nucleus inclusive events so that's kind of it's a very interesting direction to push these things uh, really create a, a discuss so think about maybe our, is one creating a small quark gluon plasma in a photon nucleus collision so here's my conclusion there are lots of theory advances really pushing to go to next to leaning order in this kind of processes both in the dipole and collinear pictures there's new high energy gamma proton gamma a measurements from the lhc and rick which give you access to the gluon content and the geometry of the nucleus and the nucleon and there's a strong complementarity with the EIC program. In UPCs, you can go to higher energy, but you are restricted to Q squared equals zero. So you need an additional thing, like a heavy quark or a jet, to stay in the perturbative regime. With the EIC, you will have a lever arm in Q squared, and you will turn new kind of light quark final states into perturbative probes. And that's kind of going in a complementary di direction to the, to the LHC and RIC UPC program. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Thomas, uh, for this comprehensive talk. Um, I, um, um, I want to invite people who have questions to raise their hands. Uh, we have still, um, we have three, um, we have several questions now. The first, I believe, was by Saleh Sultanov. So please unmute yourself. Hello, everybody. Uh, Thomas, I have a one question, really. Uh, what happens? if incoming photons are really real. I mean, uh, possible future pro photon nucleus colliders based on linear thing type lepton hadron colliders. Uh, what, is change, what will be changed in this picture for really real photons? <clears throat> I don't, I mean, the, the photons are so, so close to the mass shell already in the UPCs. So, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect any qualitative changes and only very minor quantitative changes in the picture. These photons are really kind of the, the, the Coulomb in the, in the rest frame of the nucleus, the Coulomb field extends like tens of tens of tens of Fermi away from the nucleus. It's kind of a logarithmically decaying a Coulomb field. So this means that the transverse momenta of, this, of these photons are already very, very small. I, I wouldn't expect a big change. But really, why is that the Vilna spectrum and spectrum of real uh, photons backscattered photons are quite different? And maybe some is this of, give you some I mean, uh, advantages. Of course, it depends on how you produce the photons. Of course, the flux is different and spectrum are different, but the, the photon itself, it's, it, it is a quasi real photon. Um, okay, so I why, think why, we move to our next uh, question. That's from uh, Tobias Stoll. So please uh, ask your question. Hi, Thomas. Uh, just wonder what is the um, uh, status for NLO calculations in the dipole model for inclusive diffraction? Um, in the works. Working, working on it somehow. This dipole, this uh, wave function is a crucial ingredient. But there's, there, there's other. We are, we are working on it, and maybe other people too. Uh, but there's, it's still under the works. I don't. There's no, there's no draft yet. But okay. it's going to come. Okay. Okay. Next question is by Anton Jurek. Hello, uh, Anton Jurek. Uh, my question. I was not following uh, all these developments. Uh, recently uh, my question is uh, you have this uh, steep t dependence of jsi production in ultra peripheral collisions yes which is much, which is much steeper than uh, form when electromagnetic when electromagnetic form factor of the nucleus do we understand this from theory point of view i i would say that we of course this data ha is out only very recently my, my, my statement would be that we don't really fully understand it. As I said, I would, I would expect saturation to make, the, make it steeper, but probably not by this much. And, and to, I, I'm not aware of a convincing uh, theoretical explanation for this, uh, for, this T, uh, for this T slope. But there are some lines which you are showing, uh, nuclear shadow. Yeah, so, so it depends on, so these lines, of course, uh, so they, 
lead form factor nuclear shadowing. So you can see also see already see that this BBK with the gluon saturation is it is steeper than the form factor. But if you look at the first point, if I take this first point uh, data point that's more or less t seriously, uh, none of these theory curves is as steep as the data. Okay. So the Thank you. The next question. Thank the next is by Golik uh, uh, Pinat. Uh, hello, uh, um, Thomas. I, I have a question exactly to the same plot uh, concerning this BBK uh, gluon saturation. Uh, the B dependence usually in the models uh, goes through modeling, and uh, I understand that uh, that this is the B dependence of the saturation scale in general, which would come here. In this uh, plot, you have shown: is there any uh, theoretical uh, knowledge from directly from QCD in, in, invested uh, as far as the B dependence is uh, taken into account, or is it pure modeling again in, uh, it's, all, all the time? Um, I would say that it's, of course, ultimately the B dependence is confinement scale physics. You are never going to understand the impact parameter dependence purely from weak coupling. Uh, this B, it is a sp specific for ca calculation of. Uh, they do solve a B uh, impact parameter dependent BK equation. So there is an attempt to basically kind of put in a B dependence at the initial scale, but really let the BK evolution drive it uh, forward. So I think it, it's an attempt to, to have the B dependence determined by the BK equation as much as possible, but you need to regulate the infrared somehow. And, and so there is some modeling involved there. I, would, I wouldn't say it's completely put in by hand, but there's there's always going to be some modeling involved in how to treat confinement scale physics. Okay, so uh, the last question that we have time for is by Uta Klein. Uh, please um, uh, yeah. unmute yourself. And yeah, please thank you very too. much for this very interesting uh, presentation. And in particular, it's amazing to see the next the leading order in the color dipole model. And I was just wondering, do you have a feeling, yeah, how stable is the next the leading order? Or is it because I think you showed that the corrections are large, and so how well may we trust a uh, next leading order dipole model think, device, or what what else may be needed? Uh, I think it's uh, so. This mean I, I think this is <clears throat> basically should be understood in terms of these collinear resummations. <clears throat> so kind of out of the box. Uh, it is the perturbative expansion is not very stable, and it's it's not, it's not unstable for the reason that is already known from BFKL physics from from the 90s, and and somehow in some sense in some sense a naive KT factorization frame, frame uh, approach is unstable, but we kind of understand the origin of this instability, and it requires somehow treating this. Uh, treating these collinear configurations where you have a large transverse momentum developing, a large log of a large transverse momentum, uh, we understand the, uh, understand the origin of these. And there are a couple of different, different but similar suggestions for how to deal with it. And, and somehow they, in, the end, in the end, once you do this, the results are pretty robust. I mean, in the, same that, in the sense that you get, if you look at Henry Hannan in his talk, using these different ways of uh, treating this collinear resummation in the end give you very similar predictions. So I think it is stable, but getting it to be stable requires a little bit of additional work. Okay, so I think uh, that's a good place to end. Uh, we are a little bit over time. So thank you very much, Thomas, again, for your talk. There's a question in the chat for you. Maybe you can answer that offline. Okay. Um, okay, thank so you. please thank unmute you. yourself, uh, to please uh, unshare yourself and, and our next speaker. Uh, is is uh, Sally Dawson. So Sally, uh, could you share your slides? Oh, great. Okay, so um, <clears throat> very good. So Sally, I'll, I'll give you a 20 minute uh, reminder uh, and then a 25 minute reminder. So um, we're very happy to have Sally give us this overview talk. So please take it away. Hi, okay, thank you very much for inviting me for this nice uh, conference. The pictures of the cherry blossoms are from when I started preparing this talk a year ago. And I was thinking about being in Brooklyn and seeing the botanical garden. So it's a nice thought uh, that someday we'll be back to having the conference together. 
So I'm going to talk about the search for physics beyond the standard model. And I'm going to start with my own historical perspective and then move through some places where we might look for new physics. Because, of course, the standard model, as you can see on uh, this little mug here, this cartoon, is a very, very simple model. And it explains so much that it's really worth exploring this in every detail. So predictions are, oh, did my slide change, by the way, Raju? Yes, it did. Good, OK. So predictions are, of course, always very, very dangerous. And I went back and saw this paper that I had written uh, back here in 19, sorry, in 1999 to see how I'd done with predictions, thinking about the future. Because right now, the future is very unclear. So it's actually kind of interesting that I thought that in 2006, we were going to measure everything about the Higgs. And that's sort of come true. So when we think about predicting where we should look for new physics, in history, we had this model. So the Fermi theory, muon uh, decay, tells us that uh, the theory becomes non-perturbative at an energy around 600 GeV. So if you were just looking for muon decay here, this four fermion interaction, it's pr proportional to G Fermi times an energy squared, but then the W boson comes in to make uh, the scattering unitary. So this is good. We knew that there was something happening before 600 GeV and we found the W. Again, if we look for W pair scattering, WW scattering, it grows with energy and it would violate unitarity somewhere around three GeV, but the Higgs boson, if it's less than 800 GeV, restores unitarity. So again, we knew that there had to be something, there had to be a Higgs boson less than 800 GeV or we'd see strong scattering. So we had no lose theorems. We knew we were gonna see something. However, we, we're now in a new paradigm. We no longer have these guaranteed discoveries from these no-lose theorems. So we had the Fermi theory and we found the W. The uh, measurements at DAISY at the bottom quark knew, told us that there had to be a top quark because the B quark acted like part of a doublet. And then again, we found the top quark. The Higgs, we knew we had to find it because the scattering amplitudes would grow with energy. So we knew the scale of new physics, we had a target. But in the future, we have no guarantees. We don't have a target for our, our new physics and we don't really know what kind of new physics to look for. So that implies that we have to look for this beyond the standard model physics in many, many places. So currently the limits on new physics are in the one to 10 TeV range. So the red arrows point out the one TeV scale. On the left, it's the Atlas limits and on the right, it's the CMS limits. And what you see are many, many limits so the bars show the progression of the limits to higher energy scale. Some of the limits go above a TeV. The right-hand scale on these plots is 10 TeV, and you see there's some limits that go up there. And the other thing that you can see from this is the creativity of theorists. The experimentals look for all this new physics, and then the theorists make more models. So there are limits on many, many types of new physics with no indication of any new physics in the LHC data. So we have no sign of any new particles. And as I demonstrated in the previous slide, there's really no shortage of models that predict more particles, but there's no evidence. So another way to look for new physics, given that we haven't seen any new resonances, is to look in the tails of the distributions. So if you go out to the high energy tail here, what we're looking for is deviations from the standard model prediction with the, the data. So we're looking for very small deviations in the data. And of course, to do this, you have to have the precision calculations of the standard model physics. So yesterday, we heard this beautiful talk from Raja, who pointed out the progress in calculating standard model quantities. We now have predictions that go not just to next to leading order, but to next to next to leading order, and to n cubed LO, and we even have some distributions. So this bottom line over here that shows the predictions, we've got this more and more precisely so we can attempt to measure these small deviations in the tails. So it goes without saying that this kind of way to look for new physics is kind of a last resort because it's much, much harder than looking for this nice bump. So how are we gonna look for new physics at the LHC? Well, since we don't have this no loose theorem, we're gonna use uh, effective field theory. So we're gonna ask the question, is there a light weak scale resonance? And so far, the answer seems to be no, and then we'll use effective field theories and precision calculations. And after we use these precision calculations in the effective field theory, 
we're left with the question of what, what is the source of new physics? Can we determine what we've actually found? And of course, we'd like to look for the uh, new resonances and the current limits will be strengthened at the high Lumi LHC. So the scales of new physics will go up. So this is a well-defined program at the LHC to look for resonances and to make precision calculations in the tails of distributions. So precision constraints have a long history as a technique for looking for new physics. So it started really way back with the LEP and SLD measurements and it continues today. And today the Higgs mass is a precision observable. On the right, I've shown the Higgs mass results here and you can see that it's known very, very precisely at the percent level. So if we try to correlate the mass of the top quark, which is on the x-axis here, and the mass of the W boson on the y-axis here, the green bands are the experimental measurements, and the blue circle is the prediction using other measurements, not including the direct W and top quark masses. And you can see that, geez, and you can see that there's extremely good agreement between the indirect measurements, the precision measurements, and the direct search experiments. The gray blob is what would happen if we didn't have the Higgs mass to constrain the, the theory. So there's a little bit of tension between the fit, the blue blob, and the direct measurements, but it's pretty close. We can play this game of precision measurements in many, many different ways. We can look at the correlation of the top quark mass with the Higgs mass, and this plot shows limits from the W mass from asymmetries at the Z pole. And you can see that all the fits are consistent here. The red blob is the, is the global fit here. So it's a consistent picture, but there's still room for new physics here. Everything is not exactly on top of each other. So why might we look for new physics in the Higgs sector? Why is this sort of the first place that I would look for new physics? And it's really because there are many unanswered questions that we, we think we might be able to explain in the Higgs sector dark matter, fermion masses, why is the top quark so heavy, baryogenesis, strong CP violation, why is the W mass much heavier than the electron mass, for example. So then in the Higgs sector, you might ask, why is the standard model so simple? Why is there only one Higgs doublet? So the Higgs can be a portal to dark matter. It can motivate models with an extra gauge singlet. It can give you flavor violation. You can have two Higgs doublet models. So the Higgs is an obvious place to look for new physics to try to explain dark matter fermion masses. So we've started out with discovery of the Higgs boson in 2012. And today the Higgs, as I said, is a precision tool. And it's not just the masses I showed, but it's also the couplings. In the standard model, the Higgs couplings are absolutely fixed by gauge invariance. So what if we allowed the couplings to deviate by a constant rescaling? What you would see is the prediction that the Higgs masses and couplings should fall on this blue dotted line. And this is a very recent plot using all the data. So here we go. And everything pretty much does fall on this line. So here's the tau, the B, the W, the Z, and the top part. So all the Higgs interactions are actually pretty close to the prediction. At the bottom, I show a linear uh, plot here. So you can see the deviation. So you can see these deviations from one or the prediction are 10 to 20% when this plot was made. And up here for these guys, they're even smaller. So the first step to understanding Higgs couplings is called the kappa approach. And kappa is just the Higgs coupling to the particle normalized to the standard model prediction. So it must be one in the standard model. And as I said, gauge invariance requires that it be one. So the interesting thing is to look at these predictions from CMS and Atlas. So here are the links if you want. But they're all close to one, but you can see these are the uncertainties, plus or minus 10%, plus or minus 20%, so some of the others. So we know the couplings to the Higgs somewhere at the 10% level. We know the couplings to the B in the top slightly less precisely. But the point I'd like to make is that we're really just getting to the interesting regime. If I'm building these beyond the standard model models, generically, you expect these deviations to be sort of 6%-ish. So we aren't really at the place where we would expect to see these deviations. So we're really getting to the exciting part of the LHC where we might expect that Higgs couplings might deviate from the standard model. So the projections for the future show that we're going to be able to get to sort of the one to 4% uh, level. So these are projections from the European strategy study. And if you look at any of these couplings, let's take 
up here is the coupling to the tau. The gray is the LHC, and the high lumi LHC is going to get to about 1.6%. The yellow is an ILC, and you see you get down to sub percent levels. And this goes for all of the uh, future machines that we're going to get to the few percent level in most of these couplings. But in order for this to mean anything, we need calculations of the standard model that are of the same accuracy as the measurements. And as Raja pointed out yesterday, we're starting to get there, but we're not there yet. So for example, if you look at the dominant Higgs production mechanism, it's gluon fusion. So we now know gluon fusion to N cubed LO, which is a little red band inside of this curve. So we know it quite precisely. We now have distributions to N cubed LO. So this is a distribution of uh, the Higgs, Higgs decaying to uh, two photons. Again, we have this to N cubed LO. So we're starting to have these distributions for many uh, Higgs production mechanisms at the N cubed LO level. And this matters because at the present time, theory errors dominate the experimental extractions of the Higgs parameter. So this is Atlas measuring the Higgs coupling strength, combining all of their channels and they have the, th here's the theory uncertainty is 4.8%, and here's the total uncertainty is 7.8%. So all of these measurements require the theory for interpretation. And at the present time, we really are gonna be limited by theory measurements. So over here, we have some future projections for the high Lumi LHC. And what we see is here are projections for uncertainties in various couplings to the Higgs, so a few percent in the different channels, and here's the expected theory uncertainty. So you can see that even in the future, we're going to be limited by theory. So you might ask, well, these measurements, I showed you at the beginning that we're looking for resonances sort of at the TV scale at the LHC. We're making precision measurements at the percent level, which is better, searching for resonances or making precision measurements. And of course, the only way to understand this in my mind, is on a case-by-case -case basis. So this is a very simple example of a model that has just one new Higgs particle. So it's a Higgs scalar, it has no gauge interactions. And you can ask the questions, should I look for it directly in resonances? So at the high luminosity LHC, looking for it directly, you would get this red line. But if you look for it via couplings, you would have this line here going across and they cross somewhere around a TeV and a half. So below a TeV, you're, in this particular model, you're going to discover it by looking for the resonance. If the resonance is heavier than the TeV, you're gonna discover it by looking at precision measurements. And this goes with pretty much all of our searches for BSM physics. There's this complementarity of approaches between looking for the physics by directly searching for resonances and by making precision measurements. So the other thing, we might wanna look for when we're looking for new physics at the LHC is the Higgs self-coupling. So at the moment, the Higgs self-couplings are completely unknown. We know that the Higgs couples to fermions and gauge bosons at the 10 to 20% level. And we assume that the Higgs interactions come from this nice scalar potential. This is the potential written on the mug on my first slide. It's extremely simple, but we haven't actually measured the parameters of this potential. So this potential could come from some more complicated effective theory where the Higgs cubic was some number, lambda three here, and the Higgs quartic was some other number, lambda four. We don't know how to measure the Higgs quartic coupling. The Higgs cubic coupling, we would like to measure. We know what it is in the standard model. In the standard model, it's 0.13 times the VEV, where the VEV is 246 GeV. So this is a predicted number, this Higgs cubic coupling, and we would like to measure it. So the way you would measure the Higgs cubic coupling is by, measuring is by measuring two Higgs productions. So by looking at two gluons, making two Higgses. And this happens through a top quark loop and a top quark box. So this involves the three Higgs vertex here. So we would like to measure this th three Higgs coupling. Unfortunately, in the standard model, there's a large contribution or a large cancellation between these two production channels. And there, this makes for a very small rate at the LHC. But nonetheless, this is something of a holy grail for future measurements at the LHC to measure this. So this is gonna be the next big thing in looking for new physics at the LHC to see if the trilinear coupling really is exactly as predicted.
And there's a new one. There, there's a new measurement out at the LHC that was just announced recently where they look for double Higgs production with one of the Higgs decaying to bees and one to photons. And you've seen this at this meeting and you can predict the kappa lambda, which is the ratio to the standard model and measure it. And you can see, so the star is the standard model and the yellow and the blue are the limits. And the limit now on the coupling is that it's between about minus 1.5 times the standard model and seven times the standard model. So this is very interesting, this kind of search, because if there were any new scalars in the world, they would contribute to this process and it's extremely sensitive to new physics. So in the future, we expect these numbers to be improved. So at the High Lumi LHC, you can of course try to measure the Higgs trilinear coupling. And the expectation is that there'll be something near a four sigma measurement. And all of the, the future colliders that are proposed expect to measure this trilinear coupling and get it accuracy on this trilinear coupling. And you can see various machines here and their precision. These are from the European strategy. They may have been updated since then. But what I'd like to point out that this is a game for the future because I've put in the right side here, the running years in order to get these precision. So th this is a long-term goal of looking for new physics. We can also look for the Higgs trilinear coupling with precision measurements. So again, it's this complementarity between direct searches, double Higgs production, and precision measurements of things like Higgs decays to two photons, the W mass. So it's the exact analogy of the precision measurements that I showed at the beginning. So precision measurements are also sensitive to the Higgs trilinear coupling. And it, at the present time, they give a, me, a limit that's roughly, roughly comparable to the direct search limits. So, okay, so we haven't found any resonances. We're gonna do these precision measurements at the LHC. How do we do this? So since we know that there, in this scenario that there's no light resonance, we're just gonna assume that the new physics is at some scale lambda, which is much higher than the W mass. So up at some high energy scale, there's some complete theory that explains baryogenesis and dark matter and fermion masses. So any new physics, any new particles are assumed to be at this scale. So we expect the effects of these heavy particles at the low scales to be suppressed. So at this, the W scale, the weak scale that we're probing, only the standard model, so there are only standard model particles in this theory at the low scales. So then we can integrate out the unknown heavy states. We renormalization group evolve to the low scales in the standard way. And then we have at the weak scale, the standard model, but so, some remnants of this high scale model. And this is described by an effective field theory. And I describe this as a sad scenario where there's no intermediate scale physics, but we can still learn something. We, we describe our theory in terms of gauge invariant physics. We know that SU3 cross SU2 cross U1 is a good symmetry at the weak scale. We add all possible operators that are consistent with this, this symmetry and we make an expansion in powers of the high scale. So this is the Lagrangian is just your standard model Lagrangian plus a bunch of new operators which are suppressed by powers of one over lambda squared, one over lambda to the fourth and so forth where lambda is some some high scale. So all your effects of new physics are contained in these coefficient functions C. So then the name of the game is to parameterize your physics in terms of this effective field theory and see what you can learn. So how do you do this? You look at processes such as Drell-Yan, for example. So Drell-Yan has been long used as a tool for new physics. So you're looking at the E plus E minus tail here and you're looking way out here in the high tail and you say out here at the high invariant mass, is there room for new physics? And then you parameterize this in terms of your effective field theory operators. But of course this gets very complicated very quickly because you know that Drell-Yan is used to, to extract PDFs from the light quarks from the tails. So maybe it's new physics, maybe it's something going on with the PDFs. So your fit has to account for both of these effects. So one can do these fits to these effective field theory coefficients. And what this shows is a bunch of effective field theory coefficients and limits on them. And the point of this kind of thing is it's not just the LHC. Now it's this LEP precision data 
It's Gage Boson production, it's Higgs production, it's top fork production. The sophisticated fits have limits from B physics. So it connects processes, different processes with large correlations. And then you can put uh, all these together to get a fit. And there are many, many fits of this type. So the point is just to show that we don't really know very much at this point about what these coefficients might be, but none of them have any deviation from the standard model. Everything so far in this approach still looks like the standard model. Ali, so you can, 20 minutes in. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Rajiv. So we can try to do better with these fits. We can try to use machine learning to extract deviations from the standard model. So this is a fit using some machine learning techniques. And what it shows here the, uh, let's see here, the uh, outside, the red dashed here is what you would do just with your standard fit, extracting things from kinematic structures in your data. And the blue in, in the inside is what you get from the machine learning. So this is actually using a very nice tool, which is called MadMiner. So many of us had grown up using MadGraph to do predictions. And the idea behind MadMiner is that there's a way to automate using the machine learning to do fits like this. And you do do much better than you do just by using kinematics. So I've been talking about looking for physics at the LHC, but maybe, maybe I'm looking in the wrong place. It's very, very important to look in many new places. And recently there have been several indications that maybe, maybe the new physics is not going to show up first at the LHC, it might show up somewhere different. So maybe the new physics is, is in uh, B physics. So th this plot here is recently released from LHCB. And what, what it is is something called RK. So it's a measure of lepton flavor violation. So it's the decay of the B to K in mu's divided by the decay of the B to K in electrons. So you can see that there's a little deviation from the standard model. It's 3.1 sigma here. And this is the new plot. So it's been strengthened from older LHCB data. So this ratio is one in the standard model plus radiative corrections. So once again, we see the importance of the radiative corrections in drawing any inference from new physics measurements at the LHC. So if I wanted to explain this by building a model, well, that's easy, that's fun. In the standard model, it's suppressed by small CKM angles, but in my new physics model, you can get these deviations from leptoquarks you can get them from Z primes that couple differently to different uh, generations and so forth. So you can build a model to explain this, but again, you have to compare with the standard model predictions and these standard model predictions depend crucially on the lattice. In order to get the, the standard model prediction, you need the lattice results at low Q squares. So the lattice is absolutely crucial for understanding whether this is new physics or whether we just don't understand our theory. So another place to search for physics in new places is G minus two, which probably everybody in this room now knows is 4.2 sigma from the standard model, up a little bit from the Brookhaven result. And this has inspired immense theory effort. And it's dead easy to build the model that explains this with new particle contributions in the loop, new scalars, new fermions, whatever. But once again, I wanna stress that interpreting this new physics from precision requires understanding the theory. So the fact that this is 4.2 sigma from the standard model reflect, reflects a huge theory effort from the muon G minus two theory consortium where the theorists got together to get their best theory prediction. And it would be impossible to make this prediction without the theory community really trying to understand what goes in there. So in the future, I think we're gonna see even more theory calculations, understanding what goes into G minus two, what goes into R sub K, what goes into Higgs coupling measurements to make these comparisons really precise. So let me just conclude so far, there's no evidence for new physics at the LHC, which tells us we need this prong strategy where we're looking for new heavy resonances and we're teasing out very small effects from precision measurements. And this is a very hard road to go in the future. So the case for the existence of new physics remains strong, but we don't know where it will be. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sally. You, you finished right on the dot. <laughs> so 
Uh, we have uh, time for uh, some questions. Uh, this one I see from um, Pavel uh, Nadolsky. Yes, hi, Sally. Uh, th thank you so much for a very nice talk. Uh, you mentioned the, the very interesting possibility of constraining the SMEFT theories using machine learnings in differential mm -hmm. distributions. Uh, what do people think about the course of dimensionality that arises in this case? You will work with hundreds of free parameters and somehow you need to make sense to be sure that you really see evidence of new physics and not some deviation in the standard model or, or in the experiment. Uh, Pavel, you asked just the right question. As always, okay. So this particular plot only has two non-zero coefficients and the third is profiled over it. And of course, this plot includes a certain number but it does not include them all. So you are absolutely right. So for example, this particular plot doesn't include the flavor observable. And people have started to include flavor observables in these plots and they show that it makes a difference. So I think the answer to your question is we don't really know yet how many operators you need to include. Yes. Thank you. So it's a very difficult thing to infer physics from. Okay, our next question is from Daniel Anamiak. Yes, hello. Um, I was just wondering, uh, in the event that we don't find new resonances and we have to rely on precision measurements, at what point, if the precision measurements continue to agree with the standard model, do we say, okay, that's enough, or like, do you expect the precision measurements have to deviate from the standard model at some point, or is there some energy scale which you go, okay, uh, the standard model just agrees, or is just the right thing to predict high energy? Uh, ah, that one I have a very point? definite answer to. Let's see. All right. Okay, so we see predictions for precision here going up to you know a few percent, but I have to stop when my theory cannot keep up with the, the measurement. It makes no sense to make a measurement where the theory error is much, much larger than the measurement. So this has really inspired the theory community to calculate this hard stuff. So we have to stop whenever the theory can't keep up with the experiment. So. Okay, thank you. So, uh um, next question is from Abe. Yeah, uh, Sally, based on the G minus two, since you have a nice predictive power from your early 2006 paper to now, where would you <laughs> look for the, the, you know, it, suppose next year they release a 5.5 sigma uh, significance, where would you advise this most uh, probable searches at the end? Uh, so suppose they, definitively define it 5.5 sigma. The theorists all agree there's no disagreement between the theorists. What would I say? Well, at that point, there are an infinite number of models which can explain this. And most of these models involve funny physics in the muon sector, right? Because you're talking about muons. So then I think what you would do is you would go through and look at how, do, how does muon physics change? And there's, of course, a community of people doing this already. Thank you. OK, so there's a question by Saleh Sultanov. Saleh Sultanov, you can unmute yourself if you have a question. OK, I, I'm OK. Uh, Saleh, I have a question concerning V on G minus two factor uh, standard model theory predictions. Uh, you, uh, as I know, there are tension between uh, lattice and uh, analytical calculations, and lattice calculations are uh, in agreement with uh, experimental value. Um, well, one lattice calculation is in agreement with the experimental value, but there are a number of precision lattice calculations and they use different techniques for putting fermions on the lattice. So the calculation that agrees with the standard model uses something called staggered fermions, whereas there's another equally precise calculation which comes from a, a Brookhaven group which uses domain wall fermions, which is more in agreement with this 4.2 sigma. So I think you have to wait for the lattice community to sort this out. And I know they're working hard on it. 
because the lattice community is now unified within this theory G minus two consortium to try to really figure out what's going on. So this 4.2 sigma uses a combination of uh, experimental results and lattice results and is now sort of the standard that they've agreed on. But I think you'll hear of the lattice community really pushing on understanding what's, what's going on and getting a result that everybody agrees on, but it's not there yet. Okay, thank you. So Sally, there's uh, one question in the chat. I'll read it to you. Uh, what about searches for VSM rare k on decays? Are they hopeless? Why would they be hopeless? No, I don't think they're hopeless. Okay, I, um, I think we can. Um, that goes with looking in many places. We don't know where to look. We've got to look everywhere. Okay, very good. Okay, so um, thanks very much, um, Sally, for this very nice talk. Um, and um, I think this ends the plenary session for this morning. Um, Abe, do you have any announcements? Yes, um, I have, break? I have, thank you, Raju. Uh, thank you for both speakers, wonderful talks. And uh, what I want to point out is if 